Good evening. I'm Ann Blessing, Secretary of the Board of the Charleston Literary Festival, a former English professor at Tulane University and the College of Charleston, the festival's academic partner. On behalf of my fellow board members and the festival staff, I'm honored to welcome you to this session tonight. I'd like to start by thanking the sponsor of tonight's event, Dr. Jack Schaefer and 20 South Battery. From hosting authors to hosting parties and general support throughout the year, he is a much appreciated friend to the festival. Last year, I was lucky to join the stage with Jean Hamp Corlitz to talk about her book, The Plot. If any audience members were there, can you please raise your hands? Great. We love having a repeat audience and we love the new faces. For those who are there, you know that Jean is dynamic and funny, and so is my friend and fellow board member, Summer Anderson. My kids call Summer the mom with the cool clothes, the big glasses, and the big smile. And it's all true, but Summer also has big ideas and a big impact on our community. On top of being a super mom, she is involved in numerous boards, including the Preservation Society of Charleston, Charleston Day School, and fortunately, the Charleston Literary Festival. In her spare time for the last 10 years, she has run a digital media company and website called Summer Says, in which she reviews and recommends books through podcasts and social media, interviewing authors from the Barefoot Contessa to Dolly Parton. She is one of my favorite people to talk to about books. Jean Hemp Corlitz is the author of eight novels. I like to say nine, since the plot had a novel within a novel. <laughs> In addition, she has written a middle grade reader called Interference Powder, a theatrical adaptation of James Joyce's short story, The Dead, and a collection of poetry, The Properties of Breath. Her novel, You Should Have Known, was adapted by David E. Kelly into the HBO series, The Undoing, starring Hugh Grant, Nicole Kidman, and Donald Sutherland. And her novel, Admission, was made into a film starring Tina Fey, Lily Tomlin, and Paul Rood. As a mother of a college applicant, I especially appreciate her humor around the crazy world of admissions. <laughs> the Plot was a New York Times bestseller called Insanely Readable by St Stephen King and an addictive rushing nesting, Russian nesting doll of a novel by the New York Times. It is currently being adapted by Hulu, starring Mahershala Ali. The New York Times describes this book, The Latecomer, as about complicated family dynamics, infidelity, race, class, religion, guilt, art, and real estate, and likens Jean to Edith Wharton. I love what the Washington Post says. Readers will hear in this vivisection of a dysfunctional family a Franzenesque attention to the great forces pulsing through American culture. But Corlitz writes with such a light touch that one doesn't feel strong-armed through a college seminar on, say, pharmaceuticals or bird conservation. And Anne Blessing says this book is hilarious. It's hard, <laughs> it's hard to like the Oppenheimers, but it's impossible to look away or forget them. Jean was born and raised in New York City and educated at Dartmouth College and Clare College, Cambridge. She and her husband, Paul Muldoon, have two children. On top of all of this, Jean has a company called Book the Writer, which hosts pop-up book groups in which small groups of readers discuss new books with their authors. Finally, last time Jean was here, she asked to see a slice of life of Charleston. Does anyone remember the weather last year? I took her to the Blind Tiger Bar <laughs> in the cold and the rain and with lots of sports TVs. So I publicly apologize to Jean, but I'm thrilled that she was willing to come back to Charleston on such a beautiful weekend and to talk about this wonderful book. After Jean and Summer's conversation, there will be an opportunity for audience members to ask questions. I echo Dr. David Adams earlier, who asked that when you take the mic, you stand up and actually have a question mark at the end of your sentence. <laughs> Afterwards, Jean will be signing books in the lobby, and we hope that you will buy some. These are two smart and entertaining women, and I can't wait to hear what they have to say. So please join me in welcoming Summer Anderson and Jean Hampf Corlitz. That's a great introduction. I, 
That was it's hard to follow that. And, I know. Um, well, she did a great job last year. I mean, no pressure. I, listen, a lot of pressure, and I've been feeling it. <laughs> um, Jean, thank you so much for coming back to Charleston and joining thank us. Thank you. I, I mean, I can't believe I got invited back again. It oh. can't just be because of the weather. People, people, <laughs> people love you, Jean, so we're happy you're here. And thank you all in the audience for coming. Um, Jean, we've not known each other for very long. Yeah, but I already want to import you to New York so you can be like my best friend. I know. Well, my husband would agree. He may be ready to import back. But um, so, but in the few minutes that we have gotten to know each other, I think you're one of the most interesting people that I have ever met. Wow. And you, sh you should get out more. I should probably. Thank you very much. But I want to ask you a few questions about yourself. Okay, so that, I'm ready. So I'm that ready. this crowd can can understand. Um, tell me, so you were born in New York City. Can you tell me a little bit about your childhood? I um, grew up in New York on the Upper East Side. Um, my dad was a physician mm -hmm. and my mother was a therapist, a family therapist on whom I may or may not have based Nicole Kidman character, oh. and you should have known. Just in that she was a, really a tough love mm -hmm. therapist. She wasn't, she wasn't the kind of therapist who said, you're a victim and you should hate this person or that person. Mm -hmm. She would say, how have you contributed to this? <laughs> and she also, she had a, I mean, not to, not to digress, but no, no, no. Um, she would bring home, of course, not the names and the details of her, that's oh. not me, is it? No, that's somebody else. The names and the details of her patients, but she would bring home the situations and she would say, I have this brilliant patient, she's a Harvard MBA, she has a thousand people working mm -hmm. for her, and she is with this man who is clearly stealing from her, cheating on her, using her, abusing her. And I think what she wanted my sister and I to know was that you could be smart and stupid at the same time. And it was that kind of blindness that so fascinated me when I wrote that book, which is not the book I'm here to talk about. But um, No, but it's interesting to look at your childhood and your parents and, and think how that directs your writing. Absolutely, and, and you know, they were not, they, they were both readers, they were not artists. And I, I was feeling very kind of bourgeois and, you know, uh, medical and therapy, and it was not, you know, what I thought an artist should come from. So I, I was whining one day, and my mother said, well, you know, you have this cousin who's a writer. And I, I said, who's that? And mm -hmm. uh, that's how I, I heard about Helene Hamp, who wrote 84 Charing Cross Road, oh. and uh, was a distant, um, a distant cousin of mine, and you know, having done the uh, ancestry.com thing during the pandemic, I can mm -hmm. now tell you exactly how we're related. But at the time, we just called each other cousins. So I started going to see Helene when I was a teenager, and mm -hmm. and uh, you know, she'd also come from a very bourgeois background. She'd managed to be an artist. So. Yeah. That's interesting that you were able to have a relationship with her. Yeah, she was a fascinating woman, and I l truly love her work. It, it, yeah. do, do you know 84 Charing Cross Road? Book people tend to know the I've book. I've heard the yeah. title, but I've not read it. Yeah, well, it's, it's really a book for book lovers. Okay. Um, but she, it's not the only thing she wrote. It, mm -hmm. It's the thing that made her famous. Mm -hmm. But she wrote a wonderful memoir called Underfoot in Show Business, which, you know, huh. go home, get on Amazon, yeah. buy some $2 copy, uh, from some resale dealer. It is the most enchanting book. Amazing. And it's really the story of how she went to New York in her 20s to become a famous playwright. And she never had a play produced, but she was always in the room when something amazing was happening. And she wrote about it. And um, it's just a wonderful book. Mm. When did you know that you wanted to be a writer? I think I knew in second grade. Wow. Um, because uh, I always wanted to be good at something, and it was, it was something that I, people immediately told me I was good at, so I guess I was very susceptible, but I also knew I wasn't good at anything else. It helped that I also <laughs> loved, <laughs> I also loved language, and I loved stories, and I thought to be able to write a novel was just the greatest thing anybody could do. But, but the, the distance between wanting to do it and believing you can do it is so vast that it would take many, many years before I even tried and, and more years before I tried again and succeeded. So yeah. there was a lot of self-doubt and self-flagellation and self-everything before mm -hmm. I actually managed it. 
Do you feel like at this point in your career, you've had huge success? Do you still struggle with that? Oh, completely. You do. I mean, I, I think that there are many wonderful things about being a writer. That chief among them is you can do it in your pajamas. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and I'm a woman who hates pantyhose. So, <laughs> you know, to be able to get up in the morning, roll over in bed, and start working yeah. is an enormous gift. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's hard to do. It's hard to do well. And even if you do it well, it's hard to succeed at it. So yeah. it's not uh, just because you write a novel doesn't mean it's going to be published. Just because you publish a novel doesn't mean it's going to be read. Just because it's read doesn't mean it's going to be liked. Right. And, you know, these are all, I mean, I've, I've kind Step. of gotten to each of those <laughs> stages Absolutely. at different points in my long meandering writing life before yes. that one. Well, and on that note, so I was fascinated to, to hear that you started as a poet. Mm. Not only did you start as a poet, you're married to a poet. That is true. Very successful, Paul Muldoon. Yeah. <laughs> successful poet, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> uh, what does that even mean? Yeah, famous poet. Is yeah. A, who's a famous? A Seamus Heaney was a famous poet. Who is a famous poet? Mary Oliver. If you got in a cab today uh, <gasps> here in... You don't think so? You, you don't think people would know Mary Oliver? And you asked your, your, your Uber driver, do you know Mary Oliver? Mm. I would be surprised mm. if he knew, he or she knew Mary okay. Oliver. But she was great. She was yeah. a great, great poet. And Seamus Heaney was a great, great poet. And my husband's a great, great poet. Right. But, but I, I, can't, I can't get behind famous yeah. poet. That okay. Sure. All right. Well, we, we'll rewrite that. All right. Maybe y'all can edit that out. Edit it out. Um, so you began as a poet, right. married to a poet. Can you talk a little bit about the differences, which I'm sure there are many in the process of writing a novel versus poetry, and mm. are there similarities? Well, the great thing about having started as a poet was that it really teaches you to respect language. So I've, since the beginning, even when I was writing something that looked a lot like a thriller, I couldn't knowingly leave an ugly sentence on the page. I had to fix it, it had to be beautiful. Um, you know, some sentences are gonna be more beautiful than others. Mm -hmm. She went to the store. Well, I, I probably wouldn't write that sentence. Mm -hmm. It has to be, it has to sound good. Um, so that's something I got from poetry. Um, but the great difference is that if you struggle with a poem and it fails, that's maybe a day or two of your life. Yes. If you struggle with a novel and it fails, that's years of your life. So, I mean, my husband writes poetry every single day. Wow. And sometimes it doesn't work out too well. Mm -hmm. And he shrugs and he goes to the next poem. Balls it up, That's throws it in a crash. <laughs> but um, if I mm -hmm. write a novel, and, and that's, by the way, exactly what happened with The Latecomer, yeah. and it doesn't work, I mean, it's really an existential crisis. So. Well, as it should be. Yeah. You've got a lot of skin in the game at that point. Yes, yes, and, yes. And I, so I read that you were working on The Latecomer. Right. Pre the plot. Yes. And uh, just knocking your head against the wall a little bit. Yeah, and, or a lot. A lot of it. <laughs> and then at the suggestion of your editor, you, you stepped away. Yeah, so there are a few more steps uh, to mm -hmm. that story. Oh, I want to hear. So uh, it was 2019, mm -hmm. and I'd been working on The Latecomer for a couple of years. And my editor, um, uh, uh, my, the book before The Latecomer was called The Devil and Webster. Uh, was orphaned, which is publishing speak for when your editor leaves the company before your book comes out. So, and this is very common, and it had never happened to me before, but that's just because I had been lucky. Mm -hmm. So it was happening to me with my novel, The Devil and Webster, mm -hmm. and uh, that book was handed off to somebody who, you know, mm -hmm. had, didn't even have time to read it. Mm -hmm. And that's why none of you have ever heard of The Devil and Webster. And I, uh, you know, my contract with that publisher said that they had the right to first refusal of my next manuscript. So I had this, I had a, a version of The Latecomer, and I submitted it to them. At that time, uh, you know, You Should Have Known was in production. So I knew that, you know, Nicole Kidman was coming. You know, that green coat <laughs> was coming. Yeah. Um, and I thought that, you know, maybe that would motivate this publisher to want to keep me. But no, the answer was no. They, they 
they must have hated the latecomer so much, mm -hmm. they did reject it. And the, the verdict that came back to me via my uh, agent was not even close. It was not even close. So that was quite depressing. So then I submitted it to my editor at her new publisher, and she also rejected it. But yeah. she didn't say not even close. She said, it's going to be great, mm -hmm. and I will publish it, but you have to write it again. And, and she wouldn't give me a contract. Um, I mean, I really would have loved to have had the security of yeah. a contract, yeah. but she wouldn't give it to me. She mm -hmm. said, we, we, we're not there. And so I spent the fall of 2019 rewriting The Latecomer. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was here earlier with, uh, to see Marie mm -hmm. Brenner, mm -hmm. and you know, the, the, the terror and the anxiety that she described uh, I also was feeling, but I, because I'm so paranoid, <laughs> was feeling it half a year before the people in her book. I was convinced all through the fall of 2019 that we were about to have a global pandemic, and well, I was such a basket case. Mm -hmm. um, by the time I resubmitted the latecomer to my editor, that I, I really think that, that my extreme anxiety uh, contributed to what happened. And what happened was, well, the book got turned down again, mm -hmm. and I was in my editor's office, and she was explaining to me that I had to write it again, and mm -hmm. I was totally out of ideas. Mm -hmm. I really was banging my head against the wall. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, I heard myself say to my editor, well, I have this other idea. And I didn't, really. I was kind of making it up. I mean, it, it was like, mm -hmm. it was like a lightning bolt. And I started to tell her this story of a failed writer and his terrible student and the student's idea for a novel. Mm -hmm. And she's sort of nodding, going, aha, uh -huh, mm, oh, that's interesting. And then I told her what this mysterious plot was. And I'd been kind of delaying telling her what this plot was, that this teacher steals from his student mm. because I was afraid that she'd heard it already. That, that, you know, I've read many, many novels and I had never come across this plot, but she's read every novel. Yes. And I thought she was going to say, oh, Elizabeth Strout did that one, or, you know, Emma <laughs> Straub did that one, or Jonathan Franzen did that one. She didn't. She, she kind of went, oh, like that. And then I thought, oh. okay, all right, so maybe the latecomer is never going to work. Maybe I can never land that plane. But a window is opening here. So I left the office, her office, feeling strangely optimistic. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, um, my agent called me and she said, what happened in that meeting? And I said, well, you know, we talked about the book and how I need to change it. And she said, no, no, no. What else happened in that meeting? And I, 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 and then I remember that I pitched this whole other book, yeah. and she said, you're getting a two-book contract from your, from Deb, is giving you its two-book contract. And I, and she never even heard about this other idea. I never said anything to her, because I'd made it all up in my editor's office. <laughs> so, I mean, the whole, this was, oh, God. obviously, this meeting was the, the most transformative you know, meeting of my life. Right. And it was an incredible vote of confidence from my editor. And then she said, okay, here's what I would like you to do. Mm -hmm. I would like you to put down the latecomer. You need space from it. You need mm -hmm. some, you know, you, you just, it's not gonna happen right yeah. now. And write that other thing that you were telling me about. So um, when the pandemic began a few weeks later, mm -hmm. um, another thing that I know Marie's here, right? Um, that Marie said earlier was that, that she finds that in anger and uh, fear, mm -hmm. that's where the stories are. And I really, I was so moved by that because the plot came out of anger and fear. I was so angry mm -hmm. because of some of the things she talked about earlier. Right. And I was so afraid mm. um, that all I did for four months was to write this book. I mean, I literally wrote it in bed under the covers, so like hiding from the world. Mm. So that is why these two novels, which are so different from each other, in my mind are completely intertwined, intertwined with each other. Well, you, it's interesting because I was gonna ask you, do you feel like that the pandemic affected your writing? Yep. And you just said, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it that was on yes. turbo speed. It was. I mean, and, and, and I, I know it looks like 
I wrote this, and then in the last year, I yeah. wrote that. That is obviously not the case, mm -hmm. but um, I have never had such an intense period of writing, and of course, I hope it never happens again because of what would have to be happening well, in the right. world yes. for it to be happening again. Yes. Um, but I, I guess the world put us all in a terrible situation, but it put me mm -hmm. in a rocket and it just... <laughs> sent you to the moon. It, it really did. Yeah. And, you know, it didn't hurt, of course, that I, I was in upstate New York yeah. uh, with my husband and he was writing. Yep. He was downstairs writing uh, the lyrics with Paul McCartney, okay. which, which meant that sometimes I would hear Paul McCartney, <laughs> you know, coming up the stairs, yeah. you know, not really coming up the stairs, yeah. but his voice coming up the stairs. Right. But, but the point is that he was working mm. all day every day and I was working all day every day. I did not want to watch the news. I mm -mm. did not want to read the paper. Mm -mm. And this is all I did. Yeah. So. Well, it's, it's an interesting exercise in terms of having an opportunity to just shut down yeah. and focus on one yeah, thing. But I didn't have young kids at home. I, you know, there right. were a lot of things that were in my favor, but... Mm. Um, Still terrifying, and it was, we don't want to repeat. No, never. So w when you have a book like The Latecomer, which I think well, it's kind of literal naming, you know? I mean, That's right. That's yeah. the weird thing. It's now yeah. this meta title. Yes. You know, this is <laughs> the book itself was The Latecomer. Absolutely. So when you have a, a book like this where you write and you rewrite and, you know, there's all this stress and you're frustrated, and then you come back and then... Mm -hmm. And then here we are. Right. It's going to be, it's done well, great. That's what was so miraculous because I couldn't, I couldn't have told you what was wrong before right. I stopped. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Okay. Do you have an idea of what was so hard about getting it right? I do now. Uh, okay. And, and uh, you know, if you think of this as a massive kind of palate cleanser or mm -hmm. clearing of the stables or whatever metaphor you want to use, and then I went, you know, after I finished the plot, I kind of collapsed for a couple of months. Yep. And I picked up The Latecomer again and I read it and it was like, duh, I saw it. It was so obvious to me that mm -hmm. I, you know, I didn't waste time thinking, why didn't I see this before? No. I didn't. But what was so clear to me was that, uh, you know, this is a novel with six protagonists. Yep. They're all going in different directions. I, I wanted to make them all equally um, important, uh, and that's fine, but what I had not asked of myself was, whose story am I telling? And also, who is telling it? Uh -huh. And so, the, as soon as I saw that, I, it all, like the skies parted. It was just, uh, wait, did the skies part? Mm -hmm. well, Clouds it, it, parted, the, the sea parted, whatever your metaphor you want. Um, and, you know, it wasn't instantaneous. I had to write it a few more times. But I think right. once I saw that, I felt, yes, I'm going to be able to land the plane. Here. Light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. So it was really the decision of who is the narrator. That the, the, the decision of who's the narrator came after uh -huh. I realized whose story I was telling. I got you. So um, if any of you have read the book, mm -hmm. you know that it is not clear who is narrating it. No, it is not. And this was especially a challenge for the incredibly talented Julia Whalen, who narrated it on mm -hmm. the audiobook, which is so magnificent that I have listened to it twice. Oh, have you? It is. She amazing. did such an amazing job. I need to go. I will go back and re-listen to that. So the Oppenheimer family. Mm. Whew. Yeah. Tough nut. <laughs> yeah, they're, so they're pretty unlikable people. <laughs> Have you ever known a family similar to this or a family that was so apathetic towards one another? I, I have never known a family with this particular configuration, which is mm -hmm. the family have triplets, and then many years later they have another child, um, in this case from a leftover embryo from the triplets. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never known a family with that configuration, but I've certainly known families where somebody's born a lot later. And in fact, the, the, the thing that got me uh, beginning to, to think about this book was uh, a, a memoir that I read by an English writer named uh, Susie Boyd. And uh, the Boyds were a, a very famous uh, English family. They were related to the Freuds. Oh. I think Susie Boyd was Lucian Freud's 
granddaughter maybe, or daughter, I'm not sure. Uh, that means she's Sigmund Freud's great-granddaughter. Yeah. Um, and, and during the 60s and 70s, this family were kind of having a fabulous bohemian time and traveling around the world and doing lots of 70s things. But by the time she came along, mm -hmm. it was a very different story and her childhood was like just her and her mom in a bed you know, a little flat in London. And so when people would say to her, oh, I know all about your fabulous family, she'd say, yeah, that was my older siblings. So, I mean, that's what got me thinking about what it is to be born later mm -hmm. and to feel that you have missed your family in some kind of uh, essential way. And then adding in the element of assisted fertility, meaning that there's some human randomness there, where mm -hmm. somebody says, okay, I'm going to pick this embryo to have a different fate than yeah. that embryo. Um, that was just irresistible. It's crazy to think about. And, and it's fun when you, you start to play that game in your head. Yeah. You think about, well, if it was Harrison, Lou, and, you know, just right. switch them around. It's very right. interesting. Um, totally also, you know, that the, essentially they were the same age, but they were generation apart. Right. It's kind of a fascinating It's experiment. It's a mind-blowing thing. It is a little bit mind-blowing. Yeah. Do you, why do you think the triplets did everything possible to not be involved in each other's lives? Okay, so this is the question that I am asked more than anything else about, not, not, not yeah. as a writer, but about this book. Right. And I, I rashly said in some interview that it was obvious to me, <laughs> but if, yeah. you know, and frankly, if after 450 pages, give or take, it is not ab obvious to you, then I have failed, it's my bad, sorry. Um, but that if anybody was still there, really not understanding after having read the book and thought about it, uh, they, should, they should contact me and ask me and I will answer. And I thought, no, that's not going to happen. I've heard from so many people. I want the answer to this question. And so many people that I actually wrote it out so that I could cut and paste it into emails. Oh. Um, but I will answer it for you. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you. I mean, thank you, thank you for asking. And uh, I preface this by saying that you may not be satisfied by this answer. Um, and I apologize for that as well. But there are two things going on here. The first is that this family is founded on a fault line. It is founded on mm -hmm. a secret, mm -hmm. um, a tragedy, and something that for whatever reason the parents have decided not to share with their children. Mm -hmm. That is a, a kind of existentially destabilizing foundation. Right. The other part of it, and this is also a kind of writerly thing, um, is that these triplets are incomplete. They, they are missing something. Mm. They do not know that they are missing something. And it is only when that something is returned to them that the true configuration of the family can be seen by us, by them. Mm -hmm. So these are not kind of nuts and bolts answers. It's not like, you know, Harrison kicked Sally in the womb or, mm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, Lewin spat on Harrison in the Petri dish, right. you know. Yeah. Um, there is no, there is no explanation like that. It is, a, it is a writerly explanation, and it may well be unsatisfying. And and if it is unsatisfying, all I can say is the world is full of families where the kids hate one another. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know why we should be surprised to encounter a family like that in literature when I bet we all know somebody yeah. where the siblings are dreading Thanksgiving. Well, Anne Phoebe really is the glue. I mean, she really. I mean, it, she does pull everybody together and. I feel like, um, yeah. She is, she is the repairer. Yeah. She, is, she takes on that role. She will not rest until she's achieved it. And her, um, her progress is so kind of joyful to me yeah. that um, it, it was really wonderful to write those that last hundred pages was just such a pleasure to write. It was a pleasure to read, too. Thanks. Um, okay, I would love to talk about um, the Father Sallow's art collection. Okay. That was so much fun to read about. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Agnes Martin. We had Twombly. I mean, the list went on and on. It was incredible. Mm. So... Tell me a little bit about, um, for the audience, because I have done a little research. Now, tell me how you built that fantasy collection. Did someone help you? Yes. <laughs> Steve Martin helped me. <laughs> I, I actually don't know a lot about art, and uh, 
there are two things that I'm always afraid to write about. One is money and one is art, mm -hmm. and both are in this book. So <laughs> um, I, I'm fortunate that I know Steve Martin, who is a great uh, uh, collector, and he's very passionate about art. And uh, we went out to lunch, and I said, okay, this is the situation. This is a man who is collecting art mm -hmm. not for not to create a collection he's going to share with anybody, not to invest and make money, not to, uh, not for any reason except that these particular pieces call to him in some way. Right. And he is collecting in the 1970s and 80s and 90s, and he is collecting works that invariably are worth nothing mm -hmm. in, in according to the powers that be of the mm -hmm. art world. They're, they're, they're obscure painters, they're never going to become valuable, um, and yet everything he buys is going to be fabulously valuable in mm -hmm. the year 2017, 2018. Yes. So it's like, yes, okay. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we really built fun. this fantasy collection, but the, this aspect of the character, I mean, the, this character was very obscure to me at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand him. Mm -hmm. And then I had um, this really interesting experience one night in London. I was up in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. uh, I had jet lag, and I turned on the TV and I saw this episode of Antiques Roadshow, <laughs> which is the, the British one, not the American one. Oh, okay. And there was this extraordinary story on Antiques Roadshow with this woman and her adult son, and they had brought literally kind of big garbage bag of objects to Antiques Roadshow, and as they began to take them out, they were pieces of English silver, sort of 17th and 18th mm -hmm. century mm -hmm. English silver. Okay. And the, um, you know, the, the appraiser, you know, he saw the first one, he was like, oh wow, this is very fine, blah, 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 it's worth 10,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. The next thing came out, and as, as these objects came out of this plastic bag, the appraiser was like losing his mind <laughs> because it was a great collection of, you know, 17th and 18th century English silver. Mm -hmm. And what was, I mean, that was interesting in itself, but what was really compelling was that this woman and her son were barely reacting. They didn't seem happy, they didn't seem, mm -hmm. You know, there was no pleasure in this at all. And it turned out, you know, because of course I immediately investigated this family. Uh, and this turned out to be a, a, like a famous episode of the Antiques Roadshow. Oh, really? This was not a random thing. It was like our greatest hits. Um, this was a family in which the father, who was deceased, mm -hmm. had, had put all of his passion and love and money and everything into this collection, oh. but he had kept it from his family. Mm. And you, you could see in this adult son in particular, a young man who had had a terrible relationship with his father mm. and uh, was growing ever more resentful with every piece that came out of this thing. Mm. And and the mother, you know, the kind of betrayal and the lost opportunity, and mm -hmm. it was so sad and yeah. it was so fascinating. And I got to a point with Salo where I didn't really understand him at all. And somehow this came into my head and I remembered this man and I just thought, Boom. that's him. Yes. That's him. So, you know, in his case, it was, it was mm -hmm. 20th century art, but he, you know, he, he, his family know he's buying this stuff, yeah. and they know where he's putting it, but he never invites them to see it, to share, uh, to share in the acquisition of it, to understand why it matters to him. And at least one of his children, you know, it, it might have been a great bond between them, yeah. and eventually, it, weirdly, it does become a bond between yeah. them. There is but a I, character that wheels back around to manage the... That's right collection, but it, what a lost opportunity on all fronts. Yeah. yeah, but these are the kinds of things that you, you know, you say, where do the ideas come from? They come from Antiques Just Roadshow. All I mean, over come, the place. They come from the yeah. supermarket. They right. come from yeah. the New York Times. They come from the, the National Enquirer. I mean, the, yeah. the world is full of these stories. Well, you, but, you, but you have to be open. You, yeah, you have to be open, and they, 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 they go back into your subconscious, and then mm -hmm. at exactly the right time they just and i don't believe in anything i mean i don't right. not a, i don't believe in i'm not a spiritual person i'm mm -hmm. a devout atheist since the age of 8 you know right. but but i do believe that mm -hmm. when you're writing mm -hmm. 
your subconscious offers up to you these mm -hmm. things. And right. that is as close as you'll ever get me to say yeah. there's magic in the world or there's anything beyond our conscious selves. But yeah, that's what happens. Magic in the world, magic in the book. <laughs> How, can I get a show of hands of how many people have read this book? Ooh, look at this. Wow. Okay. Exciting. That's fantastic. Well, I know that you will join me starting at the beach party on the birthday of the triplets in Martha's Vineyard when you can see the train wreck about to happen. <laughs> that was the most fun to read. I mean, it was genius how you weaved all these <laughs> plot twists in together mm -hmm. and tied it with a bow. To do that, do you have to have figured a lot of this out in the beginning? Mm. Or, I mean, I know with the latecomer, you're back and forth and back and forth with the writing of it, but I don't see how you, it would seem to me like that you would need to have some of these things tied up so that you could connect them later. But is that true or untrue? Well, a great advantage of writing, I guess, any book, but fiction in particular, is you can figure something out when you're way down on page 400 mm -hmm. and come back and put it in. So yeah. it's not like yeah. I had to come up with everything. But they, for those of you who haven't read it, there's a, there are these three triplets who loathe one another and they, they sabotage one another. And there's this kind of epic, horrible mm -hmm. scene on the beach at their uh, Martha's Vineyard house where it all just <laughs> goes wrong. And um, uh, yeah, there was quite a lot of, oh, I have an idea. I have to go back and put that in. But, but in terms of um, being very, very careful about who reveals what to whom, I have to say, mm -hmm. I went over that thing so many times. It is Forgive me, but it is perfect. Yeah. There are no mistakes. It is. <laughs> Agreed, 100%. And, and it wasn't always perfect. I, right. I don't mean like, oh, it's perfect, but I'm telling you, as far as yep. things revealed to the reader, that thing's tighter than a... It is. Tighter than the tighter jam the that was on my breakfast tray this morning that I could not open. It was <laughs> that tight. Um, do you ha when you were writing a book, um, do you have to like your characters? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, I have always risen in defense of <laughs> okay. the unlikable protagonists. Oh, okay. I think unlikable protagonists are, are you know, the salt of the earth. Mm -hmm. I, I've never understood this. Well, I just didn't like her. You mm. know, I didn't like mm -hmm. your I didn't like the character. And I just feel like, yeah. well, I'm sure they wouldn't like you either. You know? <laughs> what, I mean, what does that matter? What does that matter? Yeah. I mean, Jane Eyre is a bit of a pill. Elizabeth yeah. Bennet is right. uh, prideful, you know, yes. um, or prejudiced, or whatever she is. But mm. you know, but we we love them because they're quirky and uh, not self-aware and a little bit nasty. And yeah, I mean, uh, uh, none of these people are particularly nice. I mean, Phoebe is a good egg, but yeah, she is. Um, everybody has serious character flaws. Right. So, but I mean, if you're asking, was it more fun to write Harrison? Yeah. Yeah. It was. That's what yeah. I, <laughs> I actually could feel that. Yeah. That you were really enjoying. Oh, I was. The level of um, yeah. despicable. So Harrison, uh, you know what's so strange is people refer to Harrison as the oldest of the siblings. They are triplets. Mm. They are the same age. <laughs> and yet he feels like the oldest because he is such a pill. Because he doesn't know he has two others. He bear, I mean, he is so superior to them and he really he wants out of that family just as soon as he can get out. Yeah. He wants to join his people mm. who are um, right wing ideologues who are, you know, saving the world. Mm -hmm. um, but he's not the worst, you know? And he has some kind of redemption in store. And, yep. uh, mm -hmm. uh, but was he fun to write? Oh yeah, he was really fun to write. So we, I'm gonna ask questions for another five minutes, but I want you all to be thinking about what you wanna ask as well. Um, do you, if you were not a writer, mm. what do you think you would be doing? <laughs> well, I love antiques and I would love yeah. to be an antiques dealer. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'd love to be, um, 
uh, every time I go to Brimfield, do you, you all know what Brimfield is? Yes. Brimfield is, Brimfield is Mecca <laughs> oh. for me. And I, I think, you know, in my other life, I'm, I'm out here with my stuff, mm. um, even though I know that's a very hard life. But mm. there's another triplet in this book who ends up, uh, being a person who actually cleans out filthy houses, mm. which is not what you think uh, mm. the child of a fabulously wealthy right. family is going to end up doing, but it's mm -hmm. her passion, weirdly. Yeah. And any of you who watch, I know that people watch Hoarders. I know that my, my siblings and Hoarders are here. <laughs> um, the, you know, there's something incredibly satisfying about Ooh, yeah. uh, rescuing a house that has yeah. been condemned to death by stuff. Well, like in your real life, you can't just go in and fix problems. In this situation, kind of, yeah, you're able yeah. to do that. Well, and also too, your daughter is an interior decorator. She so is. I'm assuming you probably took her around as a child. You know what's so fun with my daughter? She spent years railing at me for the way I made her grow up in a, this 19th century house. Right. Not letting her have anything modern. Yep. And you know, she rebelled for a while, and now she incorporates antiques. And, and original features into her work. And I'm like, yeah, you can thank me now. It's okay. Yeah, she welcome. does beautiful work. But, okay. um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, we, I really, I, I wouldn't let them have video games. I wouldn't let them have, you know. My, my daughter's big rebellion when she was about 14 was to buy this incredibly ugly thing from Ikea and just put it Ooh. in her room. Mm -mm. And I let her do that. Oh, Everybody has to go through an Ikea phase. That's right, that's right. <laughs> so uh, one thing I love about your writing is that you, t you have these Mm, very particular interests, say hoarding or Mormonism or, and, and you, I love that you just dive in and you take us with, with you on the journey. Is there, are there any other curiosities or passions that you've not yet oh, jumped into? Oh, I love that you just asked me that. Yeah, because yeah, there's a big one that I left out. I'm a huge theater person. I love theater and uh, I've produced a show as mm -hmm. Anne said. Nope. Um, there is no theater in this novel, which is sad, but my obsession with, with Mormons, mm -hmm. yes. um, and, and by the way, you know, one of the nicest things about this book is hearing from Mormons who don't hate me. Um, oh, the book I'm, of Mormon, I'm, I mean the play, you know, it's hard to... Well, the, yeah. I came to my obsession with Mormon history from a Broadway musical, and okay. it's not that one. Oh. It is uh, in, in I think, 2008 or nine, the public theater in New York uh, revived Hair and in the park. And it was one of the best things I've ever seen on stage. And the two actors who uh, starred in that production, one of them had been raised Mennonite and one had been raised Mormon. And I just thought, that is the craziest thing mm -hmm. because hair, you know, this is not Oliver here, this is hair. <laughs> and yeah. um, I just started to get interested in Mormon history. And by the way, both of those actors, uh, Will Swenson, who was raised Mormon, uh, is on Broadway now. He's playing Neil Diamond. Wow. And um, uh, Jonathan Groff, the Mennonite, uh, is mm -hmm. about to be off Broadway in a, in a Sondheim play called Merrily We Roll Along. Mm -hmm. I have tickets to both of them. <laughs> um, but I just, I just started getting fascinated with Mormon history and dragging my husband up to upstate New York to see this thing called the Hill Cumorah Pageant, which is in the latecomers. Right. So all roads, you know, mm, mm, mm. came together one way or the other. But um, yeah, no, no theater, no Broadway. Um, so you have this incredible business, which started as a Kind of, a, kind of a chair, chair and it's yeah. called book the author which i think is book genius. the writer book the writer excuse <laughs> that's me. where every, everybody book the writer. does that it I'm, sounds better actually. i, I named better it wrong i it. know i named it wrong. Oh, no, i think book the writer sounds better <laughs> yeah i do i like it can you can you tell us a little bit about that sure um so book the writer started as a fundraiser for a charity in princeton that i was on the board of when i lived there and everybody made a donation to the charity and then they were in this book group okay. and once a month the author would come and we would read the book and we would talk about it with the author. When I moved back to New York in 2013, I thought maybe this can be a business, um, but also I decided I wanted to start paying the authors because mm -hmm. that was really, a, that's very important to pay mm -hmm. the authors. So um, I I started it, um, I got the formula a little bit wrong at first, and for the first few years, uh, it didn't catch on. And then I kind of tweaked it a little bit so that I create the events with the author. We have people in New York hosting them in their fabulous living rooms. Um, and, 
and that worked because what I'd been hearing from people was, I love this idea, but I can't get the rest of my book group to, to do it. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to set the schedule, and that one person in every book group who thinks this is a good idea, they will buy a ticket and come. And now that, that's what's happened. So during the pandemic, I wasn't going to go online. Um, I, I felt very committed to what happens in the room. To be sitting in a living room with, you know, 20 people and Elizabeth Strout is a different experience from being online with them. Right. Um, but my regulars started to beg me to do it. And I think they, everybody felt so isolated and they wanted to continue to have um, the experience. So for about a year and a half, we were online. Mm -hmm. And then beginning uh, a year ago, we are back in rooms in Manhattan, but we are also simultaneously online. So people can buy an online ticket and they can still ask the author a question. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, I, okay. I mean, the key was getting some interns. I couldn't have done it without my interns because right. the interns run the Zoom, so oh, yeah. I, I don't have to be you don't sitting have to deal with that. like that. It's too stressful. So we have, I mean, we, we're in the middle of our fall series. I, I had three in the last week, but mm -hmm. we've got Coming up, we have A.M. Holmes, mm. we have Edmund White, we have Steve Martin. Right. Um, you know, it's kind of, there's literary fiction, there's some commercial fiction, historical fiction, mm -hmm. memoir, nonfiction, plus we have two graphic books this fall, which is a, a new Interesting. thing. Interesting. Adult? Yeah. Or yeah, well, um, Edmund White, who is maybe mm -hmm. our most important right. living gay mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. novelist, yep. his uh, most important book was A Boy's Own Story, yep. and now there is this new graphic edition of it that's right. about to come out, so we're having him and the adapter and the artist, and we're, you know. But the, the, this, the great thing about Book the Writer is the fabulous, fabulous real estate. Um, yes. You know, our... our our unofficial motto is come for the literature, stay for the real estate. Because <laughs> as New Yorkers, we're all obsessed with of other people's course. apartments. So of one course. of our regular apartments is the Mrs. Maisel apartment where they filmed the marvelous wow. Mrs. Maisel. So, you know, I think people kind of want to see the apartment right. and they sign up for stuff there. It's fascinating. Yeah. Okay, well, I know I don't have all the best questions, so I hope you <laughs> all are ready. Will you, we have two mics in the audience, I believe. Um, will you please raise your hand if you have a question? For Jean? People are always shy at the beginning. That's all right. Once we get rolling, Jean, they're going to open up. Who's not going to be oh, shy? Oh, great. Yay. Oh, right here in front. Will you <laughs> stand, please? And do we have a mic? It's coming. Oh, we have one mic. Okay. It's coming up. So as a lover of poetry and also Paul Muldoon, um, are you still writing poetry? No. God, no. No? Why no, not? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I mean, I'll, I had this... Uh, kind of life-altering experience when I was a student in England after I graduated from college. Um, it was 1983, and I began to hear, like, in letters from friends in the States about this essay that had been published in the Kenyon Review. This is, you know, how we heard things before the internet. Somebody <laughs> would mention it, and somebody else would mention it. And, I, and, and there was this essay that people were very, very upset about. And so I went to the university library and I found the essay and I read it. And the essay was by Donald Hall and it was um, taking issue with the MFA programs, which were brand new and they were everywhere. And what Donald Hall was complaining about in this essay was the fact that these MFA programs were producing a generation of pretty good poets. And the big problem with that was that with all these pretty good poets, it made it more difficult to find the one or two in every generation who was Keats. And people were really pissed off about this, and you could kind of understand, because the message of these brand new MFA programs was, you can be Keats. And I remember reading that essay and thinking, I'm not Keats. I knew I wasn't Keats. And then I met my husband, and guess what? <laughs> he was Keats. And Aww. I just thought, I, I didn't stop right away. I actually wrote a book of poems that came out after that, but I think it, it stopped for me right there. I, I knew I wanted to write fiction. I was just too scared to do it. Mm. But that, that was a, that was a life-changing experience, reading that essay. And I, I met him once years later, and I said, 
I want to tell you about that essay, and I could feel him go like, oh no, you know, <laughs> you're going to attack me. And I said, no, I, it really meant a lot to me, and I, for me, you were right. No. no more poetry. One in the family, I think, is enough. I think that seems right. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Right here. Thank you. I have kind of a silly question. Um, so I lived in Manhattan for 20 years and moved here during the pandemic and went through the um, private school application process in New York. So I really appreciated your portrayal, which <laughs> I would say is a little bit snarky of, of the schools in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Um, how do you decide their names? The so, names of the schools? Yeah, Reardon and, and Walden. I just thought oh, they were fun. Yeah. Well, I kept waiting for a, a, a better alternative to Walden because actually there was an air private school, school called Walden. Mm -hmm. um, I think it might even, no, I think it's closed. Waldorf. That's what it reminded me of. Well, I, I, it, I mean, Walden looks like St. Anne's. It's, it's, mm. it, it's where St. Anne's is. It shares some connective tissue with St. Anne's. But whenever I write about progressive education, I am writing about my own alma mater, which is Fieldston, the Fieldston School. Mm -hmm. I did it in, uh, in, in You Should Have Known, that was Fieldston. I did it in this book, that is Fieldston. In fact, there's an infamous incident uh, that took place at Fieldston, which is known by those of us who are aware of it as the watermelon affair, uh, which is in this book. Uh, and I'm not even the first Fieldston uh, parent author to write about it in a novel. David Duchovny did too. Oh, well. Uh, so obviously it made a great impression on, on all of us. I hope there's some kind of affection in my portrayal of it, but mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a tough love to it as well. As far as uh, Reardon um, and Rourke, <laughs> Reardon is the name of the school in You Should Have Known, and Rourke is the name of a uh, strange two-year college in the latecomer. They both come from Ayn Rand. Um, that's not an accident. Okay, we, we probably have time for two more. I may have missed it, but are you a fan of Ayn Rand? Uh, no. No. I, I tried to, ooh, sorry. Of what? Sorry, I missed Of that. Ayn Rand. I, oh, I Ayn tried Rand. to read, uh, was it The Fountain? No, it was Atlas Shrugged. It was unreadable. I mean, mm. I got through it, but <laughs> it was unreadable. And, and by the way, I have also read The Book of Mormon. I have read it. Oh. It is also unreadable. But, but. More expectedly said. So, it, it's, it's a fascinating work. And, and there's this guy, I mentioned him in the acknowledgments, uh, Avi Steinberg, who is another Jewish writer fascinated with Mormonism. And he has a theory that the Book of Mormon is the great American novel. And that's a very compelling theory. I, you know, if you're even remotely interested in this, I encourage you to read his, his book. It's called uh, The Lost Book of Mormon. Hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't know you, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll get to know you. Uh, do you write nonfiction? I've written essays, but I've never written, uh, you know, a book of nonfiction. Thank you. Okay. We have time for one more question. What are you working on now? Oh, so this is an interesting moment because the night before I flew down here, I did an event with my editor in New York, and somebody said, what are you working on now? And she leaned forward and she said, don't tell them. <laughs> oh, God. So I will tell you, but you can't tell my editor that I said, I am writing a sequel to this book. Wow, yeah. yay, that is so exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting. I've never written a sequel before. Well, that's right. not true. Um, the Devil and Webster, which nobody read, was a sequel to The Sabbath Day River, which also nobody read. So nobody knew it was a sequel. It didn't matter. But okay. this sequel is actually going to be called The Sequel. Ooh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, yeah. Jean, thank you so much. Thank you, Summer. Thank you all Wonderful. for coming.